into HTML, JavaScript, and CSS when they get sent over to the client. Remember the diagram, which I'll probably draw in every single class. Um, you have a client who makes requests. Through the internet, eventually makes it to the proper web server. And in the case of dynamic, sometimes called database driven websites, you have server side code, server side programs or scripts that the web server uses to create an HTML document to send back to the client that makes a request. As opposed to static pages where the pages are finished, the pages are completed, and the server simply delivers what was completed. So the server has some processing to do. And the server takes these things, and it very well might interact with the database, And it interacts with the code, and it might interact with other information that came as part of the request. We mentioned that a request consists of a URL. It also includes a whole bunch of other stuff. That can be, uh, for example, the IP address, data that was entered in the form, data about the platform that the person's on, and so on. This information along with the database can all be ingredients in this recipe of server-side scripts that uh, creates a, a script uh, or creates a web page for the client in response to the request. Now the difference, again, between this and a, a static page is in the case of a dynamic page, the, the HTML is actually created on the fly. So we have a program that creates HTML. But remember, regardless of whether it's a static or dynamic page, what gets delivered to the client is the same thing. HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and all the other stuff. Simply a different way to make this. And this makes uh, for the web pages to be interactive, uh, to be responsive, to be customized for the user, customized for the location, customized for the time of day, all these things. Now, we talked that there's a whole bunch of technologies that can do this, all right? Um, specific to this class, we're going to be studying ASP.NET, which in our case, is going to consist of learning a bunch of ASP.NET controls. Another way to call these are components. And learning C sharp to code with those controls access and manipulate those controls. All right. And we talked about having two different files. An ASPX file where these live and an ASPX.cs file where these where the CSS code lives. So we went over last time an example of the ASP.NET control. We're going to go over some more examples of that today. We're also going to start talking about how we can program to make stuff happen. All right? Okay. The particular ASP.NET control that we looked at was a calendar. I picked that because that's sort of the most dramatic instance I can think of because one ASP.NET control for a calendar gets turned into a whole bunch of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. So let's look at that example from last time. I'm going 
going to download it and we'll spend just a couple minutes looking at it and then we'll start another example.
we can view the same page in, in design <coughs> mode by clicking on that. And we can click on the calendar and we can see properties associated with that calendar. Every ASP.NET control uh, is really an object. And what do objects have? Objects have properties, that is characteristics, and they have behaviors. There's things that you can do to them. Well, here's a list of properties. First day of the week is Monday. You can select a day. You can set any number of properties that way. You can also set them through code, which we'll look at in probably our second example. Now, remember we talked about creating CSS? And the best way to create CSS is to understand what is the HTML code that the server generates. Because if you understand that, then you can write CSS code using those things as selectors. What are things that we use as selectors? We can use class as a selector. We can use ID as a selector. We can use HTML tag as a selector. So in this case, when I ran this, I saw that the calendar control had a ID of pound sign calendar one. And we can actually see that by looking at the code or by looking at it in design view and looking at the properties. ID calendar one. In my opinion, it's good to know your way around the different modes. So there's some things I typically do in design mode, there's some things I do in code mode. So don't depend on one or the other, all right? Because you can really, you know, uh, if you, for example, never look at code, the source view where you look at the code, you can easily get thrown off if something goes the way that you don't expect it to. All right, so be familiar with the code mode, and, but also be familiar with the design mode, because sometimes that's useful to use, too. Now remember, this is a code, this is a source code. This is a code that lives on the web server. Now in our case, our web server is our development machine. So if I run this, my machine is going to be both the client and the server. I know that might be a little confusing to you, but you got to think of this as when I run it, a little mini development web server is going to fire up, it's going to process the code, and it's going to give, deliver to the browser on this machine, it's going to deliver uh, the HTML code. Remember, if we're looking at it from within the browser, we are looking at the HTML code. All right, we're looking at it from the perspective of the client. If we're looking at it through Visual Studio, we're looking at it from the perspective of the server. So this is the server-side code. I go and run this. It's going to go do its thing. Bring up a web server that is named localhost with that port. It brings up default.aspx and it displays the page the way we want it. If we were to view source, from within the browser, we're seeing what gets delivered to the client. We're seeing the actual web page that got delivered to the client. And as we look at that web page, notice there's a whole bunch of extra code that we didn't put in there, didn't put into the ASPX page. That's code that the server creates. And that includes things like that single HTML calendar control gets broken down into a table tag with THs and TDs and TRs and so on and so forth. Right, this is kind of a review of what we did last time. All right, let's start another example. So I'm going to create another website. And again, the, the best way so far in this class to create a website will be the way that I'll show you right now. The current version of Visual Studio, even when you 
create a website for the first time, it creates a lot of stuff for you. Well, we want we 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 don't want all that stuff yet. We want a simpler, more stripped down website to help us learn. There's too much stuff in in the new version uh, to to for us to look at right off the bat. So we're going to go in. We're going to click Visual Studio. I am going to go File, New, Project, and then under Web, I'm going to click Previous Versions. Because under Web Now, if we pick Web Applications, it's going to create a website that has a bunch of stuff in it that we don't need and will just get in our way. Whereas if we click previous versions, we could click and say that we want an empty website. And we can put it where we want. I'm going to put it on the desktop. And we can call it what we want. Now again, we should give it a descriptive name. We shouldn't just call it website one, website two. Don't keep it named my example, you know, whatever I chose for my example name and all that. Give it a descriptive name. So, we're going to start looking at form stuff in this example. So, I'm going to say form controls. All right? Because that's descriptive. Because that's what we're going to spend most of our time looking at in this example. I'm going to click OK. One little thing is you can choose a framework. By default, it's the most recent framework. But you can choose an older framework if you um, have to be compatible with, a, with an older framework. I click OK. And now it does its thing. It's creating the folder. And that folder will include the web config file. I can look at that on disk. There we go. And it contains a web config, a couple other config files, and a bin folder. All right. So I'm going to go and I'm going to create a start page for this. Uh, typically, we want to use default.aspx as our starting page because every page, every site should have a home page. And in our examples, the first few examples are going to be very simple, so we might as well just make those default.aspx. So I'm going to go up here and say file, new, file. I'm going to pick that we want a web form. By default, it's going to create an ASPX. We want the language to be C sharp. So if for whatever reason it's not C sharp, be sure you select C sharp. And we also want this little box checked saying place code in separate file. That will create the two files that I talked about at the beginning of class, the ASPX and the ASPXCS file. Select master page. We're not going to do anything with it now, but later on we will. All right. So I'm going to click add. It does its thing, and it will give us the shell of an HTML page. Remember, all ASPX pages are, are pages um, that um, are, are HTML pages that contain ASPX controls. So if we create an ASPX page, essentially we're getting an empty HTML page that we can put HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and we can also put ASPX controls. The reason we do, why do we put ASPX controls in? Why aren't these pages entirely HTML? What advantage does using ASPX controls give us. Yes? Um, it can be dynamic. 
can be dynamic. Does anyone want to expand on that? It's faster. Somebody already did most of the work. Right. It, it, it's faster in terms of development because these components do some things already. They already have code sort of behind them, built into them, where they have certain behaviors. And people already wrote that code. And that code has been really thoroughly tested. All right? And it will allow you to do things in a consistent manner. So therefore, if I were to do, if I were need to do validation on this page, which I'm going to need to do, right? I'm going to create a page that needs validation. If I need to do validation, I could write my own JavaScript validation, all right? But someone has already written controls that do validation for you. So it's quicker in terms of development time because you could write a component much quicker than simply taking a component that's already written and using it. All right? This is the difference between the old days when every horse and buggy, well not every horse, but every buggy was created by hand and modern manufacturing where you had components, interchangeable parts, so you could put together a buggy simply by grabbing wheels out of the bin and grabbing an axle and grabbing a carriage and that sort of thing. Okay, so let's take a look at all of the, the, the components that we have available. The components that you could put on the page exist on the toolbar. I'm going to pin that toolbar up here so it stays. There are standard components. All right. I'm going to hit the, the highlights of this. There's a button that we can put where there's already code that triggers certain things that happen when you press the button. There's a calendar control, which we looked at before. There's a checkbox, a checkbox list, drop down list, file upload, so if you want to allow people to upload files to your server, a hidden field, a hyperlink, an image, image button, a label, a link button, a list box a multi-view, radio button, radio button list, table, text box, and so on. These correspond to just basic HTML elements. Now, in the case of the calendar, we saw that um, one calendar control translated into a whole bunch of HTML. For many of these, one of these controls is going to, uh, there's going to be a more direct one-to-one -one translation. For example, Let's start out by putting a text box on the page. Put a text box on the page. That is going to translate into an, uh, simply an, an uh, input tag. All right, input type equals text. So if I look at the code, I have an ASP text box right here. Its ID is text box one, run its server. So if I run this, it's not going to be as dramatic as when I put the calendar up there. Remember, when I put the calendar up there, I, 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 ran, uh, I ran it in the one, uh, one ASP.NET component translated into a whole bunch of HTML. This is going to be a more one-to-one -one translation. So if I run this, and I look at it from the client perspective, and view source, that ASP.NET text box translated into an input type equals text. So it's a very direct, simplistic translation for this particular component. But it still benefits us to use them because there is default behavior associated with this. We can easily take the value of this and do something with that. All right? Much easier than if we use the standard HTML control. So you get greater flexibility of what you can do programming-wise if you use these ASP.NET controls. Because all the properties that exist for this, we can write C-sharp code to use them. So we're going to start out doing the classic 
example that, that I do every semester, probably in every programming class. Converting uh, Fahrenheit to centigrade. Okay? So I'm going to allow you to enter in the temperature in Fahrenheit, and it will calculate the temperature in centigrade. Okay? Should be easy enough. What's the formula to do that? Does anyone know? I sometimes know and sometimes don't. I have to think about it. I think it is Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 nines. That's what we're going to go with. And we'll test it. So I think to calculate centigrade, centigrade equals 5 ninths times Fahrenheit minus 32. I usually test for 32 and 212. 32. If I plug 32 in, that's 0 equals 0 centigrade. That's correct, right? Because freezing in centigrade is 0 degrees. If I plug in 212, which is boiling, 212 minus 32 is 180 times 5 nines equals 100. So 212 Fahrenheit equals 100 centigrade. So I'm pretty sure that's the right formula. All right? Okay. So we're going we're gonna to go and do that. We're going to create the code that goes and do, does that. All right, I'm going to put some labels on here, too, just so that we can label our, label our, our inputs, label our answers. So I'm going to drag a label here. Notice I can drag it either in the visual view, the design view, or the source view. So I could go and drag a label there. And the text is label. I'm going to change the text to say enter temperature in Fahrenheit. All right, just for laughs, I'm going to go in here, and I'm going to drag a button over. And I can set the properties in this property window down here. So I can make the text of the button convert to centigrade. Then I'm going to put two more labels here. First one, I'm going to say temperature in centigrade. And this one I'm going to initialize to be nothing, because until we do the calculation, we don't know the answer. probably should give these things descriptive names. So these IDs, notice these IDs. It simply generates their name sequentially. So the first label I put out there is label 1. The second label is text box 1. Oh, I'm sorry, the second label is label 2. Third label is label 3. The first text box is text box 1. Button is button 1. We should probably give them descriptive names because that will help us out when we're coding. All right. Again, does does the web server care what we name them? Of course not. You know, but it's going to be easier for us if we give them good names because um, later on when we're coding, you know, we don't have to remember was label one, uh, was label two or three where we put the answer. All right. So I'm going to call this. Fahrenheit LBL centigrade LB 
LVL result. Text box, we'll call it TXT um, Fahrenheit. Button, we'll call BTN Convert. The way I like to do it is I like to give like a three-letter abbreviation that says what kind of control it is. So LBL, and I know anything that starts with LBL is a label. I know anything that starts with TXT is a, a, a text box, and so on down the line. doesn't really matter what you do, but it's kind of good to do things in a consistent way. So... If you're going to use this prefix some of the time, use it all the time. All right? Let's run this and see what we get. All right? Let's run this and, we, and see what we get. expected to get. Label, text box, button, label. There's another label here, but there's nothing in it. Now if I type in something here and hit convert, absolutely nothing happens. Alright? Why not? Because we haven't coded anything to happen. The server isn't smart enough to know, despite the words that we've used, that we want to do a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. So it doesn't do anything. Uh, actually, I lied just a teensy bit there. It did do something, but it had no effect. Because notice what happens when I click the button. You can see something happening on the screen. Even if it's only that blinking. What is it doing? It's actually sending the information to the server to be processed. So it's posting the information to the server. All right? It's making another request for the web server. Now, because in this example, we are both the client and the web server, that happens like that, where we don't really even see any, anything. It's not like the page takes like 10 seconds to reload. All right? But it actually made a request to the web server to say, go and process that data. All right? So if we put something in here and click that, it's actually going back to the server and doing anything, but there's no code to tell it how to process the data, so it doesn't do anything. If we were to look at the HTML for this, we will see the labels translated to spans, the text box translated to an input type equals text, the button translated to an input type equals submit, and the labels translated again into spans. Now submit button, you might remember from your CISS 216, sends the data back to the server to be processed. Now, where does it send it to? It sends it to whatever is described in the action. The action is default.aspx. Well, that's the name of this file. So in this example, the server processes, the, the script that processes the input is the script that has the form on it. Okay? So this page submits to itself. So the logic to process this data will be the same as the, uh, will be the same page. The logic to process the data will, will be on the same page as the form itself is. Okay. So right now, in a nutshell, we don't have anything except the way the page looks. We have the user interface for it. We have a label, a text box, a button, and then two other labels. Any questions about this? 
Now to do the processing of that, this is what happens in C sharp. All right? Because C sharp is where we can do all those cool things. There's nothing in HTML that allows you to do math, right? There's nothing in HTML that allows you to retrieve data from a database. There's nothing in HTML that allows you to do a comparison. If the value is this, do this. If the value is that, do that. There's nothing in HTML that does any of that kind of stuff, right? So there needs that, that kind of stuff, that kind of manipulation of data needs to happen in a programming language. And in our case, we're going to be using C sharp for that. So we have to tell C sharp, we have to put code in our C sharp file that describes what we want to do when the button is clicked. Okay? So I'm going to go to design view and I'm going to double click the button. All right, so I'm in design view and I double click the button. And what it's going to do is it's going to bring up the ASPX CS file. Okay, and it will create a function that gets called when the button gets clicked. All right, so I'm going to double click this button. And it opened up the C sharp file. See, we're not looking at the ASPX file. Uh, uh, yeah, we're looking at the CS file, ASPX CS file. And it created a function called button void btn convert click. And there's a place for us to write code there. All right. Now, this is where we're going to put the code. Because this is a code that fires off on the server when the button is clicked. All right? I'm going to put some dummy code in there now. And I think writing dummy code is a good idea. What do I mean by dummy code? Dummy code is uh, where you put in code that doesn't really do everything it's supposed to, but just allows you to sort of test it out a little bit. All right? I want to make sure everything is is sort of working, all right? It's not actually doing the calculation, but it can display something. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say LBL result dot text equals answer goes here. And then it ends with a semicolon. What is LBL result? The, yes. The uh, label for the, where the results going to The label where the result was going to go. Specifically, it's the ID of the label where the result's going to go. What is dot text? The property of it. Remember these controls. And object-oriented terms are actually objects. An object is a thing that has properties, that is characteristics, and it has methods. I can't simply say something like this. Set the text box to that. It gives me an error. All right. I want to set the text inside the text box. So I have to say T-E-X-T. What kind of property? Uh, I said text box, I meant label. Here's a list of all of the properties that exist for that text box. Maybe not even all, maybe just some of them. I can do all kinds of stuff with those properties. I can make it visible or invisible. All right? So I could make it so that under certain, under certain conditions, that disappears. All right. It wouldn't make for a very useful application, but I could do that. Maybe if it's too cold of a temperature, I make it disappear so I don't scare the users with how cold it's going to be or something like that. All right. But one of the properties is the text. So when you define a component or an object, you have to say specifically what about that component I want to change. And what I want to change is I want to change the text that is contained in the label. 
So now, I'm going to run this page. When I run this page, the page loads initially and uses all the properties that I have set for all these controls. So, that label for the result doesn't have anything in it. All right? I type something in, click convert to set a grade, what's going to happen? It's going to send it back to the server and it's going to execute the code in that button click method. So it's going to say here's where the result goes or whatever I typed in. So I click that, answer goes here. Okay? So. I load it up initially. This page gets loaded with the initial values for all those controls and all those properties. I click the submit button. It sends it back to the server and runs this button convert click method. And what does that do? That changes the property of the label text to answer goes here. So that's what we're going to do a lot in this class, is when we do something, we're going to change something on the page. We're going to change something on the page or we're going to do something based on the values that are in certain controls and based on, uh, and we're going to put the place, we're going to put the results somewhere on the page. Okay. Let's take a quick look at the code itself for the ASPX page. Notice for that button convert, there was added an on click method. That's really what tells the web server when this button gets clicked, do this code. Just because it's called the button name underscore click doesn't mean that that automatically will run when you click on the button. This is what tells it that that's the code that's going to run when it gets clicked. So, what is the process that I really want to go through here? All right, I don't simply want to display answer goes here. I want to get the value for Fahrenheit. I want to perform the calculation. And then I want to store the result in the label. Okay. Notice what I did there because I'm behaving myself today. I wrote my comments before I actually wrote the code. All right. Why, is, why do you think that's a good idea? Yes? Sort of uh, doing pseudocode sort of right now what the logic's going to be so it's easier to break it down and actually write it out. Yeah, now this is a pretty simple operation, right? But if I write the comments before I write the code, then I've thought through what I have to do. All right? This is how I'm going to do this problem. I'm going to get the value of Fahrenheit, I'm going to go and do the math, and then I'm going to store the result there. So, yeah, this isn't particularly earth-shattering, but if you had a longer process, that might be valuable to spend a few minutes thinking it through before you actually do it. All right? There's another reason I put the comments in then. Why, what do you think the reason is that I put the comments in at the beginning? Because no one ever in history has gone back and commented it later. All right? Every programmer I've ever worked with, including myself, has said, well, I'm writing the code now. I'll go back and comment it later when, when I have some free time. Guess what? You're not going to have any free time. You're not going to go back and comment it later. 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock going to roll around. It's time to go home. It's like, yeah, I'll get that tomorrow morning. 
Tomorrow morning you're going to be sleepy and you're not going to feel like writing comments, so you'll go and surf the internet for a couple hours and then you'll start coding and you'll forget all about putting the comments in later. So putting in the comments in advance, uh, besides giving you the opportunity to think through a process and how you do something, ensures that you make the comments. All right. Um, and comments, again, are one of those things that we do to make your code more readable with the thought that more readable code is easy to, uh, easier to change, will take less time, and so on. All right. I'm going to create a couple working variables. I think it's just complaining that I've not used it yet. Yeah. What's a double in C sharp? Pardon me? It's a number. Anything specific about it is a number. Does it have decimal points? Yeah. Yes, it does. So it's, a, it's something that allows us to have a number that has decimal points. What is the range of values for double? It's like 2 million something. Yeah, I don't know. Negative 2 million to yeah. whatever. I don't know. It's a big range. All right. Probably will be big enough. We could Google it if we really wanted to know. What you said sounds correct. C sharp. Range double. Oh, even more. Fifteen or sixteen digits. Wow, that's that's crazy. All right. So yeah, that should handle the temperature. So. I want to grab the value for Fahrenheit. So Fahrenheit equals forgot the H. Forgot the H. It's going to come from the text box called text Fahrenheit. All right. This is not correct. Why is that not correct? There's no property. There's no property. I said that a number equals this text box. Well, a number can't equal a text box. That doesn't make any sense. So what I want to pull is I want to pull the text property from that. And that's still going to give me an error. Why is that? Yes? Because the text is string in. Fahrenheit's a double, so it can't convert. Yeah, it can't. Con it, it, it doesn't know for sure that it can convert it, right? Because it's a text box. I might behave myself and put a number in, or I might put in just some letters. So it doesn't know what I have typed in. So it, it, it knows that that might be a problem. This can be annoying at first, but this is actually a very good thing, all right? This is what's called a strongly typed language, which means you have to make sure every piece of data is the right type or is of types that you can easily convert, like one kind of number to another kind of number. How do I convert to a double from a string? Double parse. Well, I'll tell you what. I, I don't remember exactly. I, I think you're right. Let's Google it. Might even be more than one way to do it, but we'll do this. Converting string to double and C sharp. Yeah, this guy looks like a troublemaker. <laughs> oh, there's a convert to double method.
Okay. So now we want to perform the calculation. So centigrade equals 5 divided by 9 times Fahrenheit minus 32. Okay? So, yeah, that works. So finally, we want to put that where it belongs. So we'll say LBL result equals centigrade. And we sort of get the opposite there, right? Centigrade's a double, and uh, we're trying to put it, well, we're trying to put a label, so that's not correct. Even if I say label text, it's still going to tell me that that's not correct because that's a, that's a number and we're trying to put it into a text. Now, I know that you can put numbers in the text, right? But the compiler ensures that it's the right type. So you have to explicitly do conversions, all right? So, uh, so I can say to string, and that will make it a string. Okay, so this should work. Notice double, when I did this, I didn't have to put any properties. I just said Fahrenheit equals. Whereas with this, I say label result dot text. Why, why is there no dot something here? It's not an object. It's not an object. What do we call things that are not objects? Variable. A variable. Uh, that, that's one possibility, but they're kind of all variables. We call them primitives. You think of primitive as being like simple. All right. Okay, so this should work. So now I run it. I type something in. And if I tab out of it, nothing happens. Right? Why did nothing happen when I tab out of it? Who is doing the calculation? Yes. Because he didn't click the button. Because I didn't click the button. What is the impact of clicking a button? Clicking this button? It sets up the code because it's a click event that you saw. Right. To, to, to answer that completely, it does set off the code because it's a non-click event on there. But specifically, the code only runs when the server is called. And in this page, the only time the server is called was when you click the button. So when you click the button, that will call the server to process this. And since button was clicked, it will go and do it. We'll see cases of that, like if we do other things, where we might want the server to get called if you change a value or if you change, pick a different item in the dropdown or so on. But in this case, the server only gets called when the button is clicked. And then the on-click code can run. So I click that, and boom. Looks right, right? 32 degrees centigrade. Fahrenheit is, uh, is 0 centigrade. 212 is 100. That's on.
here's what happened for those of you, uh, whoever said it over there was, was right on the mark. Um, if I say five nines, it sees that five and nine are integers, and therefore it makes my answer an integer. So five divided by nine is less than 0.5, so it rounds it down to zero. So it's going to take zero times that. What I have to tell it is, nope, I want decimals involved. And then it will treat those as decimals and it will do the calculation correct. So, nice little puzzle uh, for this morning. Okay. So now we should be back to working. Negative 40 should be negative 40, and it is. All right, so I'm pretty sure we got that right. The problem is that we don't have any error catching whatsoever. So you can type anything into that text box, and bad things are going to happen. <laughs> All right? Specifically, let's see what bad things will happen. What if I hit run? What happens if I click convert to centigrade I don't enter anything in? It blew up. Blew up on this statement. You can't convert nothing to a number, to a double. So that blew up. It gave me an, uh, an error. System format exception. Input string was not in the correct format. All right, let's run this again. What happens if I type garbage in here? Essentially the same thing is going to happen. You can't convert that text into a double. Now, it blew up and it gave us some pretty good hints as to what's wrong. It gave us an error message. Now, those error messages aren't always terribly descriptive, but they do give you some information. System format exception. Input string was not in the correct format. And it shows you the line that got that error. So if we look and we put our mouse, hover our mouse over that, it shows us txt text is that. Hmm. Okay, I can't convert that. It's not in the right format to convert into a double. All right, how do we fix this? How do we fix this? We put validation in. Now, a lot of people that like did really well in C Sharp can write some code here to go and do the validation. Have some if statements in here. We're not going to do that. I'm going to encourage you in this class to be lazy. All right? Not all the time, though. <laughs> you should qualify that. Not all the time. I'm going to encourage you to be lazy when the situation calls for it. And what, I, what do you think I mean by that? Be lazy when the situation calls for it. A general try catch. Okay. A general try catch would be one possibility. Use the components. Use the components. Don't write code for yourself if there's already a component that does it for us. And there is a component that does it for us. There are validation components. All right? So let's take a minute to look at some of the validation components. We'll probably get through one or maybe more examples, I don't know, of this. But let's look at this text box we want to validate. Now, if we look at the basic things on a web page. There's data components that we're going to use when we start doing database stuff. There are navigation components that when we talk about navigation, we'll talk about AJAX stuff and so on. For now, we're going to look at validation components. And there's a set of validation controls that we can put in that we don't have to do anything but configure those controls and the functionality will be there for us. 
And the great thing is, is the functionality will work both client and server side. Okay? That's sort of the real benefit. That's another benefit of using these validation controls. Is that typically validation we have run on the client side. That is, we write JavaScript validation. At least for some of our validations. But what if someone has JavaScript uh, disabled? They shouldn't be able to circumvent all of our validation simply by clicking a button and saying no JavaScript. So I'm going to put in a required field validator. What is a required field validator? Just what the name sounds. It means that the field that we enter in has to be entered. We can't put in a blank. Because if you notice, a blank blows up. So I'm going to go and drag the control over onto the page. And then I'm going to set the properties of it. Required field validator. We can configure the error message. Right now, though, error message says required field validator. That doesn't sound terribly descriptive, right? So I'm going to type in must enter Fahrenheit temperature. Now, we have to specify what control we want to validate. Because we could have a form that has a whole bunch of text box on it, right? And maybe some of them are required fields, some of them aren't. So we have to specify for each required field what which, which field is a required field? So I have to specify that that's TXT Fahrenheit. So with a drag and a little bit of typing and a click, I've created JavaScript validation for this field. All right? I have no problem in, in assuming that you all, either right now or with a little bit of practice, you could all write JavaScript to validate this box. But the best JavaScript coder in the world can't get it done in that short a period of time, in 30 seconds or however long I spent. All right? So therefore, and what's more, not only can, can they not do that, they can't to write code that works both on a client and the server. It would be very difficult to get done in that short period of time. So now, when I run this in, when I run this, If I try to get by without putting anything in, oh, I get a dumb error. Okay. This is something that is annoying about Visual Studio. I have to put, uh, the way the defaults are configured, it does things in a goofy way. So I'm going to Google this error message. And I'm going to find a line of code. that I'm going to put in my... This could be me speaking. Why is this even an issue? Why could this just be disabled by default? Who would ever want this enabled anyway? That's, that's almost verbatim my words the first time I got this error. But if we go and we, we take this snippet of this, this code and put it in my web config file, Now it works. The lesson for you, 
rewriting pages that have validation, find this example, take this snippet of code here, and put it in your web config file. All right, now, this will work if there's nothing in the field. So if I, if I get clever and try to put some spaces in, or if, I, if this is literally empty, it'll work. But, what if I type garbage in? I'm back to Air City. All right. This gets to be a little frustrating at first, but it's actually good that it's set up this way. Because this allows you to really customize how you want the validation to, to occur. Really, the validation rule for this is that I want there to be something there, and I want it to be a number. So that's two validation rules. Something has to be there, and that thing has to be a number. Now you might say, why couldn't I combine that into one validation control? Well, sometimes it's okay if the field is left blank. What if there's an optional age field on a form? Where you could put an age in if you wanted to, but you didn't have to. How old are you? And you could put in I'm 48 or, or 36 or whatever. But you didn't have to put a, uh, an age in. You could leave it blank if you wanted. What if there was a place to put your email address, but you didn't have to put your email address in? Well, if you entered your email address, it should be the right format, but you don't have to enter an email address. Same thing with phone number, birth date, and so on. So by making you, these components do just one little job, yeah, to really validate this, I have to add two components as opposed to one. Who cares? That's a minute of your time instead of 30 seconds of your time. Still easier than you writing it by yourself. So I'm going to go here and I'm going to put in, and this is always a little confusing for me, but I'm going to put in a compare validator. Now, compare validator, you can actually do two kinds of things in. You can compare it to make sure that, like, two values are, uh, uh, like, like, the starting date is before the ending date. Let's say you're doing a query to see all your transactions on your bank account, and you put in a starting date and an ending date. Well, you better make sure your starting date's before your ending date, right, or it's not going to show anything. So you can do that kind of comparison, or you can compare it to see if it's a certain data type. So, I'm going to say I want to validate TXT Fahrenheit and the kind of comparison I want to do is a data type check and the data type is a double. So this will make sure I can only type in a valid double in there. And I'm going to change the error message from compare validator to must enter a number. So now I run this. If I leave nothing in there, it gives me that error message. If I type garbage in there, it gives me that error message. If I type in a proper number, it actually does a conversion for me. All right. We'll talk more about this next time. That was a good place to stop. So I will go and open the doors in lab. I'll then come back here, grab all my files, and post, uh, you know, grab all the files so I can post them, and then I'll be back over in lab.